plan next time. Reach me Alright, well, later. Go. <laughs> this is like a little I just remember looking around and seeing, thinking like, I found it, like this is, this is it. It's run by kids, put on by kids, and the bands were kids, the fans were kids. Anything's possible from here. It, that's the moment like my life really began. Like I was born in 76, my life really started in 92. At the end of the day, KISS really is what brought me into everything. When I was very young, we're talking like five or six, my mom bought me KISS Love Gun record, I know. Not realizing what Love Gun actually referred to, but once KISS, I was like, God, there's gotta be more out there, even at a super young age. And then once I got to be, um, I don't know, under 12 years old, probably 11 or 12, we discovered Ernie November. Ernie November was a staple in Sioux Falls, obviously, for most people. I literally would be like, yeah, that, that, that artwork's cool. Okay, I'll buy that. Oh uh, yeah, I'll buy that. And I would just walk out with like huge amount of stuff I'd never heard. Of. And that's how I got into like rich shows, No Direction, um, Face of Decline, the band that I ended up joining at age 15, um, which was my favorite band at the time. When I was probably 11 or 12, we, we had cable and MTV was new. And you know, I absorbed anything on MTV, and it was it was all great. A friend of mine from school gave me a Black Flag and a, a Dead Kennedys record, and I was like, okay, this is what I'm going to listen to now. You know, I was listening to the metal of the day, like Iron Maiden and and Judas Priest and stuff, and and um, ran across some new friends that. Uh, Played me the bottle of surfers. And um, I was like, wow, that's really crazy that there's stuff like this in the world. I always had leanings, like sort of to a punk rock attitude, but I didn't have a lot of the education about what that even really meant. So it, back then it wasn't cool, right? So back then, like, the whole punk rock thing wasn't, like, a part of the norm. You know, I remember it was definitely a, a like, it was something for, like, you know, weirdos and D&D nerds and, like, people who like weird music. And, like, it, it was something for us. To, it was, like, an outlet. But what really opened my eyes was discovering a band called Descent that was from Rapid City, South Dakota. Um, to this day, they are always going to be my heroes. They are like, I mean, they opened my eyes to everything from animal cruelty, racism, homophobia, sexism. Back then, you don't write email, you write letters. I'd scribble my little letter, letters to them when I was like 14 years old, mail them, and I'd get a response back a week later. And, I'd ask them, literally ask them questions about um, like how to do things like combat homophobia, how to combat sexism, how to, because when you're 14, you don't know. All I did was scream from the highest mountain and hope something got heard, you know, and they were the ones that, you know, like would tell me to, we do benefit shows here. We do benefit shows for the homeless shelter. We do benefit shows for the um, woman's battered shelter, you know, and um, they really helped, helped guide me a little bit. I did my first show when I was 15, like literally right when I got um, into Face of Decline, I was doing shows probably three, four months later. So it seemed like, well, if, if something's gonna happen, I have to make it happen. And I can't, I can't even remember exactly what year that would have been, 88, maybe somewhere in there. Um, 
but that's when I met Terry and me and him hit it off really well right away. And things at that point, I think real soon after that started migrating and focusing on Nordic. It was kind of a venue that was mostly for wedding receptions and stuff like that. It didn't have a stage or anything. I think uh, Terry and Chad Pettit and some other people built a stage together out of uh, whatever they could find to put it together with, about a, maybe a six inch tall stage. And it was in pieces that they hauled in the back of somebody's pickup whenever there was a show. You can't escape the stuff that you found when you were 12 to 20 years old. You know, whether that's music, whether that's art, whether that's religion, like what the things as you're coming of age, the things that hit you and you find are going to influence you throughout your life. Do you remember the first show you went to? Yeah, it was it was um, April 24th, 1992. Um, it was Reach and Switch and 40 Ton Beat. <laughs> it was an all local show. My mom reluctantly drove us to the show, the first show. And she dropped us off like three blocks away per our request. It was the most insane thing I've ever seen. It was, a, it was a whole room circle pit, and it was sweaty and it was hot. There was sweat dripping off of the ceiling of Nordic Hall, like liquid and condensation. It was disgusting, but also really fun. It changed my life. It changed all our lives. Everybody who was there, Nothing has ever been the same since then. At the end of that show, I walked out and I cut my mullet the next day. The idea of like you would just know somebody in a small town somewhere that might have a, a club or an inn at a club, but also might just have a backyard or a basement, that seemed like a, a fairly new thing. It's not something that the first wave of punk did. The, the first wave of punk was basically, you, you know, just like traditional rock, you tried to get signed to a label and put out a record and get your manager or the label to do something for you as opposed to doing it yourself. I had friends and bands, obviously, in California, and they needed places to play and stay from Seattle to Minneapolis. And so I got in contact with these people, and they're like, hey, cool, let's, let's skip the guarantee. If you can get us a place to stay, that's awesome. If you get us a place to play, that's even better. So we started doing that, and uh, they're like, all right, well, we need a place to play and stay in Sioux Falls. I'm like, cool, I know a couple people through the scene uh, Terry Taylor obviously being one, Chad Pettit being another. The first couple shows I did for like Descent and Libido Boys, some regional bands, these bands were touring the US. They would tell bands to get a hold of me. And next thing I know, that's when Green Day and The Offspring and um, Neurosis and all those bands just started contacting me like directly. They're like, hey, I, I heard you do shows in Sioux Falls. I do? I mean, yeah, I could make that happen, I guess. <laughs>
just you look back on like everything that came through at the time and you just kind of like shake your head like jesus like that was a very charmed existence there for for at least like like indie music nerds it seemed like it was overnight right when you get a band like green day that comes through that are young kids touring 200 days of the year and they're telling every city every city they go to bands they play with like hey get a hold of terry taylor in sioux falls south dakota we were we were absorbing culture from everywhere around the country just any punk scene around the country was just sharing so we were just consuming it because we were hungry for it. A successful show is one that uh, you come out of there feeling that something transpired. South Dakota shows were went off the fucking handle. Kids were psyched. You know, it was great. Everyone was trying to figure out what punk rock was and what doing it yourself was. That was the beauty of it. We could do what we wanted. We weren't I mean, I don't want to speak for anyone else, but it was pretty obvious that no one was trying to like impress anyone. The music was awesome, and I really enjoyed that this was happening. So it was, it was really just exciting seeing, you know, a local thing happening. Didn't translate very well. I think that's what's beautiful about Sea Falls is it doesn't translate anywhere else, especially at a pre-internet age. We were just doing it so wrong, and it's it was so beautiful. I would save my lunch money so I'd have money to go to the shows or whatever. So I'd just buy like less lunch. I mean, shows were like four bucks. Um, but there was a show, I think it was a Buzz Oven show, where I didn't have enough money to get in. So I snuck into Nordic Hall early and hid in the janitor's closet. <laughs> and it was just sitting there like as quiet as a mouse and just being so nervous that I get caught. And then Terry opens the door <laughs> and I'm standing there just like in the corner, like terrified. And I was like, dude, I just didn't, I didn't have money to get in to the show. And he so kindly was just like, Sean, if you don't have money, just let me know. You can, you never need to pay to get into a show if you don't have the money. So, I mean, that kind of meant the world to me. What he did for the weirdos in Sioux Falls, eh, we'll never be able to pay him back for that. He gave us all a home and it's something to feel a part of. We were just like the bad kids, right? We didn't have anywhere to go. Um, so Nordic Hall shows for me were this safe space. You know, they were a place where I could come and hang out with my friends and feel a sense of community that I never felt during the school day at Lincoln. It's hard to know if like who I was like brought me to the scene or if the scene made me who I was or whatever, you know? For me, it was just really eye-opening to know that there was this whole um, subculture out there. I grew up in private Catholic school and didn't really didn't have any idea that things like basement shows and hardcore bands existed. Well, I grew up in a town an hour from Sioux Falls, Mitchell, South Dakota, which is home to the world's only corn palace, which lets you know how middle of America it is. So you grow up in these small towns and you feel different. You're not playing football or baseball like everybody else is doing and you feel a little bit like an outsider you think that you feel like you're you're weird or something and then you find out that there is a small community of people that all are like you and feel like you 
And then there's these bands that have this sound that feels like you do. And then you feel, you're like, oh, this is where I belong. You know, we definitely stuck out as, as miscreants or just something, somebody that they should be watching. You know, I mean, I had a lot of incidents where I got pulled over or, you know, I mean, I got thrown on the hood of a cop car once because they thought I pointed a gun at them. I, uh, I, I might have deserved to be thrown on the hood of the cop car that particular time. Being punk in a smaller city or a small town is just a little more dangerous than it is in a big city. I think that they were just looking for something that wasn't there. It's wild, frenetic, almost crazed. And if you're not careful, like our photographer, you may end up in the middle of it. This is when all my problems started with the city. Kello, I let Kello News come down and, they, and then it turned into the whiplash story. They did a story where they're like, um, what do they call it? Like Sunday night headbanging. Welcome to Sunday night thrashing at the Nordic Hall. Thrashing, yep. <laughs> Welcome to a world where no one cares what you wear or how you style your hair. They ask nothing of their peers and are asked nothing in return, except to have fun and listen to the loudest music you'll find anywhere in Sioux Falls. At the very end, the newscasters talked about smoking at the club and said, like, don't worry uh, if your kids come home smelling like smoke. Also, if, if your child does go there and... Uh, uh, whether or not he or she smokes, when they leave that, they're going to smell like they smoke because uh, a lot of the teens do smoke down there and uh, there's not a lot. So somebody there. like on the city council found out their daughter went to shows and wanted to stop all the smoking. And I think that that's like what kicked off the ordinance. <laughs> All of a sudden, I got notified um, through Nordic Hall that any, and this was a, an ordinance from what, 1932 or something, that if men and women are together, or minors, I should say men and women, and there's minors involved, were at a place where there would be dancing, that it was illegal. It was full loose. I was beside myself because I'd finally built this thing, and it was like, this was like the height of like how things were going, and then the city with one foul swoop. There was a lot of um, uproar about it. A girl named Amanda Jensen was really proactive about battling the city uh, about it. Um, obviously I was. There was a lot of kids that were very in, um, upset, obviously. I spent days, days just waiting at City Hall for someone to, to talk to me. And I literally slept outside a couple nights, like, so I could get there right in the morning and just no one would have me. And it, it became such a point of contention, like business owners speaking out against it because kids would come to Nordic Hall, but they'd also go downtown and spend a lot of money too. I mean, and people started traveling from like Worthington, Minnesota and a lot of surrounding communities. And it was a safe, really good place for the kids. School is a big stress. I come here and it's so fun. You can just be yourself. You don't have to worry about anything else. What, what Terry does for these kids is probably the most positive thing in Sioux Falls at this time right now. It's the best. It's the best escape ever. You know, I um, don't really remember like how I was notified that it was overturned. I'm pretty sure I just saw it on the news to be truthful. It was an issue for about a year, and then it just wasn't. We all had like this common goal of just creation. Like we all just liked to create, and just being a young kid in like expressing yourself through music and stuff. There's something about like just fighting against the norm that I think connected us all a little bit. Everybody had some type of talent, whether it was in music or in art, and it was just us trying to find our avenue of expressing that. And I think that was something that was important to me, was that it wasn't just an, an adult or an authority figure saying, 
this is how it has to be. It was all of us kind of coming together and saying, this is what we want. How can we make it? People were doing shows in their basements and their houses and their garages, putting their, uh, together their own packaging for, for releases and stuff, booking their own tours. You know, everything was self-done. You kind of, can, you know, as a collective, you're, you're creating the culture at that point. It, it was kind of an interesting, you know, kind of microcosm of how a society works, right? Like, organically, we all kind of developed our own places within this little group or this little society. If a lot of people, if they weren't in a band, they would publish a zine because everybody wanted to do something for the scene, whatever they were good at or whatever they could figure out how to do. And everybody was figuring out how to do things. And it, was, it was fun. Sometimes I would help make flyers and we would sit and make um, mixtapes of all the bands that were going to come through. We went to like whatever the dollar store was then and we'd get, get tapes and sit there and take hours and hours just to make them and then hand them out at shows. Without even really trying, knew I couldn't do anything musically. Um, <laughs> but I had always done art. So with a combination of doing art and then purchasing zines and learning how to DIY screen print. I tried it myself and then just started doing printing and making merch for bands because that wasn't existing. So I, I, that was a way I could somehow be involved in this scene that I want, you know, that I wanted to more, take an at more active approach in. I was, you know, 13, 14 years old. Terry was maybe 14, 15. So, uh, which blows my mind now thinking about things because now thinking of 13 and 14 year old kids renting venues and doing that kind of stuff is just, it doesn't, it just doesn't happen, you know? I think kids coming to the show, seeing that a group of us were able to pull these shows off, a grassroots kind of thing, inspired them to go do things on their own. It was a group of people who were very driven and, and very independent. Um, very willing to take a chance and, and uh, it was just crazy. I didn't feel, you know, even thinking back on those times, I, I didn't think of myself as a 14 year old kid. You know, I thought of myself as someone who wanted to play in bands and wanted to, wanted to move ahead with things, you know. For, yeah, for me, the excitement too, I think was like this sense of community before you even really knew what that word meant. You know what I mean? Like the, just seeing uh, people that you know uh, were like you and looked like you and, and, and that didn't look like you all kind of congregating in one place and uh, working towards just the common goal of like making things happen was exciting for me. I feel like we had kind of a mission and we were like dead set on it and that's all that like really mattered. I can't tell you how many people have told me I started a band because I wanted to play Nordic Call. My whole goal with Words Not Spoken was to play Nordic Call. That's the reason I was like, I need to be a part of this too. And unfortunately, we uh, were one show short of playing Nordic Call before it got shut down. The Pomp Room opened up a whole other demographic of people. I mean, we hadn't had a place to call our own since Nordic Hall. And even though Pomp Room had its own bumps, their heart was in a really good place. The staff, they just had been handling bikers for 20 years. So when you have these matinee all ages shows, they had to learn not to handle a 15 year old kid like a 30 year old biker.
I had no idea even what the pomp room was. You walk in through that weird side door. Um, I walked in, it was dark. It may have literally been like the first time I'd ever been in a bar. Like I remember the first time I was there and we were sound checking. I'm standing there with a mic in my hand, looking down, I'm like, I'm standing on the same stage that Danzig played at. Marilyn Manson played on this. The Texas is, I saw Texas is the reason play here. You run it, goddamn Aerosmith played it. You know, you started as like, and now it's my turn for our dumb shit. I guess I never for a second questioned anyone's talent. I mean, I don't think we ever really had a tuner for the most part. They were like, hey, you're flat, I'm sharp. Like, and Mike's not hitting either one of these notes, right? You know, like you don't, <laughs> I never thought of that stuff. first label show was um, at that skate park that was like in the north of town. Like we, we played on like the top of like the ramp or whatever so it's like kind of hard to forget. And I was just like nervous as hell. <laughs> you know I mean A we were up really high and B just like playing like you know playing songs in front of like your friends for the first time it was like yeah it was kind of nerve-wracking. Having a discipline where you have to sit down, you have to think about something, you have to organize it, you have to practice it, you have to try to get better at it, um, and then stand in front of somebody. Especially when you're doing music, it's like standing naked in the middle of the road. And you know, that's pressure. That's a lot of pressure. You know, I never had a, I, I don't remember ever having a bad experience with, uh, with what I call a kid band. <laughs> but, uh, um, I mean, they came in, they uh, uh, almost always knew the music cold when they got here. We didn't know what the fuck we were doing. None of us even knew how to set up an amp. But at the time, it was just mind-blowing. I, you know, I don't remember prior to going to Yearsay ever, like, I'm sure, you know, you see a Beatles photo album or something of like, here's Abbey Road or something, but going into his studio seemed odd. A little bit of quiet, then we can start. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, 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 And Scott was cool enough to work with us in our limitations. You know, we saved up all of our money from our shit jobs that we had and our shows that we made almost no money from and practiced our asses off because that was our only shot. That was all of our money. That was everything we were ever gonna have at that time in our lives. So it really meant a lot to us. I think I think I figured out United was the place to press records, and I, I don't honestly remember exactly how, but other than I think I had records, and I think, like, honestly, Discord said, you know, like, pressed at United or something like that. And, you know, I think at the time, no one was really, you know, outside of punk rock, no one was making records. And so I kind of think they were slow, and so they were, like, loving the fact that people were actually making records. So they were like, another 15-year-old's on the phone? Like, <laughs> Bob, you want to talk to this idiot?
we were all kids for the most part, at least my friends that had come out of like uh, trying situations. Like either we were poor or disabled or like had some sort of fucked up family life. It, we also couldn't, we couldn't fall back on something because our parents didn't have money. We were desperate and we were hungry for something that we could call our own. I think that Sioux Falls wasn't really ready for kids like us. I don't know how many times Jesse Brandt and I got soda cans and beer cans thrown at us walked out, walking down the street. We both had shaved heads and so it was dyke, whatever, lesbian this, you know. Um, that kind of stuff happened all the time. and. There was like one Green Day show where some of those kids were at it and I was kind of this like mixture of like pissed off that they were there, but like, well, at least they're not trying to beat anybody up. There was a new element that came in and, and seemed to enjoy that, the physical altercation part of things. There would be occasions where people would come in and nobody knew who they were. They were just some random dudes and they wanted to fuck shit up. And it was really hard not to go, well, this is a thing that we've been doing. This is a thing that we've been building. And this person just wants to come in and totally disregard that. Once in a while, you would get the kind of strangers that would come to a show. This guy is like, he starts like, kind of, you know, when someone doesn't get the communal circle pitting, or it's someone thinks you're just there to hurt people. Well, that started happening. Well, Steve Von Till was playing guitar and you see this mic bash him in the face like, two different times and you just see the eyes. And let me tell you, neurosis back then, intimidating as fuck. Like, I mean, they were like these Bay Area crust punks that were dreadlocked and just massive guys who play the angriest music you can imagine. Um, you see him jump in the crowd and like nail this guy like three times. And uh, we're all like, oh my God, did that just happen? You know, after 94, um, it became very normalized to, you know, listen to punk rock or be in those, or go into those shows. And you watch that scene change, um, especially in the, like, the mid lanes to the late 90s to early 2000s. You'd see people that had other avenues to uh, utilize their talents. And um, this was a lot of our only avenue. Um, so these people kind of felt like interlopers. Uh, like, you're not gonna catch my ass on the football field. So I'm kind of like, stay the fuck out of my gym. And you know, I'm always kind of a weird kid. <laughs> so, you know, it was a place where I could just like be myself. And I mean, I met just people that, that really didn't care if I was weird or. I think there was just a sense of, you know, we're all on that island of misfit toys together. We're all a little bit broken or we're all a little weird or we're all a little different. And so, you know, we kind of celebrate that together. Maybe the, the show itself isn't even the main event. You know, it's really just this uh, sense of community. Even if you don't know most of these people, like you're still somehow bonded in a way. The people that didn't stick around were the people that concentrated on the music. But I think the people that stayed were the people that liked the sense of belonging and community. Everyone I knew that I really, I guess, maybe cared about was so in the scene that that's all I paid attention to. I don't really, for the longest time, ever really remember knowing most of the bands that were coming. It was just like, I don't know, there's a ska band tonight, so I'm gonna go. Like, why? <laughs> why am I going to see Skank and Pickle for the third time? <laughs> but never dawned on me that I shouldn't go to a show. It was just, there's a show tonight, so you go to every show. Anytime we went on tour, we were able to find these little nooks especially when we first started, and you see these flourishing scenes and everyone is so appreciative of you being there. It's a lot different than playing in Los Angeles where they don't give a shit. You have these like little stepping stones to get you through the tour and you knew Sioux Falls was gonna be good. I remember not going to prom because there was like a, a show at uh, Nordic. You know, like I didn't, I wouldn't have gone to that. You know, I didn't go to the, you know, that kind of stuff. It was just, it, it felt, that to me felt like where I belonged. I never even bought a yearbook because nobody I knew was in them. Nothing that I did was represented in them. The flyers to me just held more value of what I was interested in and makes me think more of that time than a high school yearbook ever would. I was family oriented before I had a family because 
the scene was my family. I remember, I remember one time, um, we were all, it was a, it was a summertime week night, right? And we were all hanging out at the Advantage House. And the Advantage House is the house behind the Advantage Machine on Minnesota Avenue. So a few of us, well, actually a number of us were hanging out there. I want to say it was about 7 o'clock at night. It was a nice, warm weekday evening. And this is pre, pre most cell phones, but some cell phones existed. So there was a house phone at the Advantage House. And a friend of ours called the house phone. The friend who was calling on the cell phone was frantic and was like, we're being chased by like these crazy dudes, like four crazy dudes in a car. They're, they keep screaming and yelling that they're going to kick our ass. We're just freaked out. We don't know what to do. We're going to come there. Like, can you guys help us? And, you know, somebody starts spreading the word and sort of shouting like, you know, these other guys are in a car. They're being chased. They're in trouble. We don't know what's going on. And, uh, you know, the three people on the couch stand up and then the couch cushions lift and three people get out of the couch from under them. <laughs> like, that's what it felt like, you know, it was just, I thought I had been hanging out with six people at this house. And by the time the cr uh, the crowd of us had gathered to save our friends on the front lawn, there must have been 35 people out there. So they pull up, screech, tires. Seconds later, a car pulls up behind them, screeches the tires, and there's some shouting that commences, right? But it's like really preliminary shouting. So our friend Bill does the like psycho thing, where you just take it to a level <laughs> <laughs> just, you know, like if you just, somebody was going to beat you up and you just strip naked and started throwing your poo around and screaming bloody murder, you know. So Bill starts doing that and, you know, doing the like puffing his chest out. And, Come on, you want to do this? You want to do this? And like, and I kind of chuckled up under my breath at it. But I knew, I knew one of the guys that got out of the car. And I had seen him do some serious shit to some other guys at, at Roosevelt. Um, and I'm not going to name his name because he's scary, <laughs> but, uh, he was one of them. And I thought to myself, well, this could get really bad. Well, well, Bill does this peacocking thing where he just goes bonkers and these guys just sort of like back down and they just all kind of put their butts up against their car and they're like kind of looking at each other and I'm like, what the hell is up with this dude? And then I come out and I've got whatever the worst beer you could imagine is. And I'm like, hey, so-and-so, that I, whose name I won't mention, it's me, Sailor, from Roosevelt. You remember me. And he's like, oh yeah, hey man. And he's like, I think this was just a misunderstanding. And then everybody kind of calms down and everything gets a little bit chill. I'm like, you guys want to grab a beer? Like, I think it's all good, right? We're all good. Um, and... Uh, Somebody took Bill away because he's sweaty and red in the face and his pro he probably had one eye that was bloodshot at that point from his own screaming and, you know, everything sort of disseminated and people crawled back downstairs and turned the movie back on or whatever and went back to what they were doing. And uh, to me, that's just emblematic of the, the, the ways in which as frayed as our scene could be at times when, when someone was in trouble or something needed to get done, everybody everybody would pour onto the front lawn and figure out how to get it done. And I just imagine what that looked like through the lens of those four dudes in that car chasing our friends, because I have a feeling they had no idea what they were walking into. We're all marginalized for a variety of reasons. Some of us are marginalized because of our genders or our family situations or our race or whatever. And as a result, we look to find a, something that we can feel connected to. And I feel like punk rock was the thing that a lot of us were attracted to. Um, we were coming from different places, but then there was this moment in time where we we're like, okay, like you are weird and that's fine. That's t fine that you're weird and you're crazy and that's fine. You know, like whatever it is that makes you different is fine. Because within this context, we see you. We don't see your difference, we see you.
La yeah, after label, it was Thinnerland, I believe, which was me and Mike Tretta and Jamie Rood and Matt Staub. Uh, I don't even remember like why he joined the band with us. Like we all loved Matt. Matt Staub was great, but like, I mean, me and Jamie and Mike were definitely like in our like kind of militant, like straight edge, like metal, like phase of our lives or whatever. And Matt was definitely not that. So like he kind of like made fun of us for all that stuff and like rolled his eyes a lot. I remember he was very free with his scrotum. He, he would do the thing where he stuck it out of his uh, zipper and then he'd be like, I have gum on my pants and you'd have to look down. It was very free with his scrotum. He was, he was full of life and he just wanted to make other people laugh and you know, he was, he was a joy to be around most of the time. And <laughs> he just had this fuck it, I'll do whatever attitude and he loved life. That's why it's so hard to, to accept that he chose to, to end his life himself. He was kind of the chronicler of Sioux Falls punk. Like, he worked at a certain copy shop. And I remember spending entire days there formulating flyers or creating album cover art. And it should have been hundreds of dollars. And Matt would ring it up and it'd be like 15 cents. I'd, I'd been in bands, but I was always in sort of a passive role in those bands and making a zine was the first time I did something completely on my own. Matt was the first person who uh, saw something that I had written and said, I think this is good. And that, that was a big deal to me. There, there are people in your life, your, your teachers and your parents that are, are supposed to be supportive and they're supposed to say, you know, this is good that, that you did this. And then um, Matt, but Matt didn't have to do that. I think even more so than going to shows, publishing a zine taught me that uh, that no one's stopping you from, from making the things that you want to make. If you don't like what's on the radio, you, just, you start a band. Then you, you make a tape, you make a seven inch, you make an album, maybe you make a book, you make a movie, you open a brewery or a bar or a tattoo shop. We, we were lucky to get a taste of that early on, that understanding that um, the, there are no rules, there are no gatekeepers, um, if you don't want there to be. You know, I think we've produced a shitload of very talented people in a very short window of time. Say so 86 to 96, that a lot of those people who were in bands that were actually working hard have gone on to do some pretty credible things. It's not a coincidence that these people were all in a room together listening to music or sitting on a curb uh, after a show. Uh, it's not a coincidence. That is people who give a fuck trying to find each other. That's what's going on. And then when they find each other, that gives them the kind of momentum or energy to go on and give more of a fuck as they get older. I, uh, I am a director and writer. I live in Los Angeles. I do mostly horror movies. I don't think I'm any different. Honestly, I don't think I've changed at all. I think I'm the same. That's the nice thing about being in, in art, really. I mean, whether it be music or advertising or any sort of thing that's an art type thing, is you can, you can always, like, um, I'm still wearing shorts and t-shirts and hats and, you know, I look the same. <laughs> I have glasses now and I'm older. Uh, and probably fatter, but, well, actually, yeah, fatter, but, um, I don't think I've changed at all. More than anything, it kind of probably taught me if you want something, you got to work for it hard, and nobody else is going to believe in what you're doing. I mean, you have to believe in yourself first. But I've been able to get by in life because of a lot of the things that I probably learned about relationships, how to talk to people, how to do business in a professional and respectful way. A lot of stuff I learned, you know, from, you know, early <laughs> music experiences. My 
my wife and I, we were we were out to eat, and these people behind us were on their lunch break, just talking about business and like the forty hour work week and blah, 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 and all these expenditures and shit. And I was just like, I can't imagine having that be my life, man. And just like. I got to work for something that makes me feel good. And I think it all started there. I feel like, yeah, those, those years of like just doing stuff on our own, like, like booking shows, especially like, I mean, I think that definitely ingrained in me that you don't need like some sort of like larger system in place to like make things happen. You can make it happen on your own, which is, kind of, I mean, what I've been more or less doing as like a designer. Like, I mean, it's mostly just me here in the studio. I mean, I've been working for myself for like 15, well, yeah, almost 15 years now. <laughs> no, I mean, it's kind of like the way I did stuff for friends' bands. Now it's just like I'm doing stuff for like people I know that just happen to have like budgets and <laughs> work for like well-respected organizations in the art world. <laughs> Starting off your afternoon show today with Star Roving from their self-titled release from a few years back. And my name is Troy Nelson. Great to be with you here on the afternoon show. All these years later and I'm still heavily involved in music and I'm a radio DJ but also playing a band that's got to tour across the country in Canada. I'm still doing exactly what I was doing when I was 16 years old in Mitchell, South Dakota. I'm doing the exact same thing. And it's because I found a whole bunch of people, or a small amount of people, I should say, in South Dakota that all felt the same way I did and made me feel less weird and made me feel like I could actually go for this and do this. I work at the Federal Public Defender. I'm a paralegal here and we represent uh, indigent people, poor people who can't afford attorneys who are charged with federal crimes. I didn't really want to just make money and not care about how I was making my money, you know? I work downtown with some union attorneys. We. Uh, they represent um, teachers and some service industry workers. But I really like that job. I like uh, working at small firms and the union attorneys. I mean, we've been dealt a lot of pretty terrible stuff, even over the last couple of days. And here in Missouri, uh, with our legislature here this year, um, but you know, I can sleep at night. In early 2007, I got a call asking if I wanted to be involved with the Bright Eyes Tour. What they were wanting to do is something with live visuals. I said yes. Got about a month, not even, maybe it was a couple of weeks to like play around with like trying to figure out how to like make it happen with, with a, like an Elmo projection unit. Yeah, that just, and then that just opened, opened other doors. I mean, there was one time where I was gone for like, I think six weeks and came back for three days and was gone for another four weeks. Um, and, you know, coming back every time and my wife would be more and more pregnant every time I'd see her at the airport. I'd just be like, this is, you know, and then, and then knowing, and but knowing at the same time, like, this is going to be even harder when there's a kid involved. And I said, like, this is, you know, this is my last tour. Like, I gotta, I want to be home now. So I got the call from um, Brigitte McQueen Chu, who was a direct, who was a founder and director of the Union for Contemporary Art. Maybe six months, seven months out, um, I started working there full time, and and now, yeah, now I'm director of facilities at the Union for Contemporary Art. It's a great place to work because it's not just, I mean, it's a nonprofit art center and there's opportunities just for, for artists, but it's, it's what specifically started um, having, a, having the mission statement of seeing the arts as a vehicle for social change.
when I was in fourth grade or whatever, I picked up the drums. I was going to play the saxophone or the clarinet or something. And my best friend Gretchen said, I'm going to play the drums. And she was sort of the dominant one. So I said, okay, I'll play the drums too. And I was a tap dancer, so maybe I got rhythm from that. Well, forever, I kind of was like, oh, you know, it's not about me being a girl. It's just me, me about being a band. And it took me a really long time to realize the impact that I may have had. Having two daughters um, really changed my perspective. And I just, I can see it now, like the impact that representation has. Like she attaches anything, like, like Mickey, Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, she attaches herself to Minnie and Daisy. And I realized how important those female characters are to a young girl. I never had that. Maybe I just didn't as, I think I was always a tomboy, but she, it's really important for her to see women doing things. Because I was a woman in a band, I always felt like I had to um, prove myself or something. I felt like I was an outsider in in a band. I always felt like I was an outsider and I felt like my gender was always the focus rather than, you know, the. it's like, oh yeah, that band with the girl drummer. It was always that. I don't know what it is. I just kind of wanted to be seen as the equal. I never knew her that well, but of course, of course I saw her and it was like, yeah, like, um, she was so cool. Like <laughs> I would not never go up and talk to her or anything, but like all of the girls a couple years younger noticed, you know, don't worry. We noticed like <laughs> there were a couple of girls in bands, but I mean, it was noticeably minimal. Um, and I think that, I don't want to look for excuses, but I think that kind of affected my comfort level with giving it a shot. I wasn't comfortable because there was still this way to be a feminist punk rocker. You had to not wear makeup. You had to not look sexy. You had to not. I mean, there were still even rules about how you were supposed to be a feminist. Now, this wasn't coming from other women because there were not that many of them. And I think it was probably because the, the guys were so young that they couldn't quite handle it in a way, you know? Sorry, guys. I teach a lot of girls, which I get now. I think there are two male teachers and then me, and I think I end up getting a lot of the girls because, you know, I, I'm sure their parents might want a female teacher. My favorite age group is middle school, I think, because they're, the, they're getting to the point where they can you know, actually do it, they, yet they need a, a lot of guidance, but they're having a ton of fun doing it. Okay. So I think that's kind of the most exciting age to me. So I was in a motorcycle accident uh, two years ago, and I got pretty banged up. And when I realized that I was going to live, I uh, also realized, came to the realization that my hands were really fucked up. I definitely thought it was possible I wasn't going to play guitar again. Um, I'd broken a lot of bones and ground off some tendons, and one of the bones, a few of the bones in my right hand didn't heal correctly, so then they had to open my hand up and then break the bones that healed and then reset them and put more pins in. And I was going to lose my little finger, and then the finger next to it was broken and healing weird. So I was looking at a Django Reinhardt type of situation in my mind. I was just like, well, I guess I'll have to use two fingers. But um, 
I got them all back, man. I just work so I have enough money to live and play music. I always try to play all ages shows, which kids don't really like my music anymore. So uh, that ship has kind of sailed a little bit, but I'll always play an all ages show and I'll always play for cheap or free. Playing now sometimes can feel like, I don't know, of course the audience is different and I've played in a handful of different projects over the last couple of years, but um, sometimes it's kind of hard to not feel like you're trying to like relive glory days or something or like why am I still pushing this <laughs> like but you just want to play music Sophie, who's almost four, for her birthday, wants an electric guitar that plays loud. We don't push things. We don't want to push things, but I feel like, and but kids pick up on things and I don't know. I'm excited that she wants to do that. I'm really excited, you know? Like she wants a, she wants a guitar that plays loud. Like we'll, we walk up to the guitar store and she tells them every time. Uh, <laughs> and, yeah, so, you know, we'll get her a guitar to play out for her birthday. If you can't be comfortable in who you are, it's very hard to, to be happy. I really drive that hard and home as much as I can with my kids. It's just be okay being you. You know, no matter what happens in life, people will always make fun of you. They're always going to have a comment. They're always going to disagree. They're always going to find something wrong with what you do. So just be cool with that. Cleo knows what it means if we say we have to go to sound check. When she like plays pretend, like the mom goes to band practice, which I am kind of proud of. I don't feel really cool most of the time, but like <laughs> in those moments, I feel proud.
And there's always change. I mean, just as times change, the music taste changed. I mean, I remember, I mean, I was very fortunate working at Ernie November. I would see what people were starting to buy. And I remember when Screamo, like when, you know, like Tim Jewell and Tanner Olson and, all, you know, the Spirit of Versailles kids came into it. They started doing their own house shows and everything, which I was like, what? Someone besides me is doing shows, you know? But I loved their enthusiasm they had. I mean, those kids created their own scene. It became very self-evident to me that, um, you know, the scene was changing in a lot of different ways, which necessarily didn't involve me, which is very hard when you've been the center of it for many, many years. And I just felt like my place in the town wasn't, I felt like I didn't have a place anymore in the, in the city. Like when the pomp room closed, uh, that was like a pretty big, like I say, like punch in the gut for me because I'd spent, you know, all these years like raising up Nordic Hall and then that just kind of went away and then got into the pomp room which had never done all ages shows before until I got involved and spent eight years building it up and all of a sudden I get the call like well we're gonna be a parking lot you just kind of get tired of battling the same I've been battling I was battling the same thing for 15 years because Terry was getting the calls for the bands like the you know the bands that had management and agents and you know, things like that. I was getting calls from a band on their second tour whose friend in this band played in Sioux Falls and said it was cool. That was what I dedicated my early 2000s to, was continuing the Sioux Falls all ages community that meant so much to me as a kid. And then when I had to move to doing it as a job, you know, I felt like I almost had to sort of abandon that. Like the all ages scene really kind of shriveled up. Not a hell of a lot of us noticed necessarily because most of us have been going for show a few years. We're now old enough to go to 21 and over shows. So we didn't really, it was almost kind of like this like generation behind just kind of got left out. All, all scenes will constantly change and evolve. And if the kids can't go to shows and can't um, start a band when they're 14, 15, whatever, um, then scenes just die. And then, and then they need a resuscitation, which more often than not comes from getting the kids back involved in the scene. Every day since I've left Sioux Falls and moved here, I've missed working at Ernie November. I've missed working at the record store. Well, welcome to 1313 Mockingbird Lane. <laughs> uh, little toy store I decided to open up in Lawrence, Kansas. Um, been kind of a long time coming. I think anyone that's known me through the years has known that uh, toys have always been a passion of mine. I've always, it's always been music, movies, and toys. It just um, made sense down the line now that I'm not really doing, I'm not entrenched in the music community like I used to be um, to do something else that I can put my passion into. Working in a toy store and working in a record store is almost the exact same thing I've learned. 
just the narrative is just a hair different. Rather than about bands, it's about toy brands or about specific genres of toys, whatever. It's, it's funny, like the, the customer service aspect and the relating to people and, and finding that you're not the only nerd in the sea of, you know, nerd culture, or toy culture, record culture, whatever you're into is, is kind of um, comforting. I get really sensitive when people are like, you created the scene or you, I hate stuff like that because we, we all did it together and I think people kind of forget that sometimes. It had always been just sort of like a quiet little dream of ours. You know, we would travel to Minneapolis or Omaha to see amazing bands, you know, and think, God, I wish they could come to Sioux Falls. How can we get them here? Sioux Falls really hasn't had a music scene until a few years ago. But I think once uh, Dan and Liz opened Total Drag, uh, that was the moment that we started having a music scene again. We're a, a record and cassette store, new and used vinyl, um, but we also have a dedicated space for all ages music. And honestly, when we opened the shop, we had no idea if there were kids interested in music or shows or anything like that. Um, and we were pleasantly surprised that there are. <laughs> Every kid needs a place where they can feel comfortable and have fun. And, Music's super important and it's a way that we can all connect no matter 14 or 50, you know. One of the main reasons that Gilman Street was able to exist in Berkeley was because people from the previous generation, at least a few of them, were like, oh yeah, we got to give the kids a place where they can be themselves and express themselves even if we don't understand it. I'm always working the door, smiling, saying hello. Dan's always working the soundboard. We feel like we have a little community here and we hope that it kind of does what it did for us and give them that community that maybe they haven't found elsewhere. Just pick a typical small town or not so small town in America and look at the punk scene today I would, I would think that it's probably it tends to be pretty vigorous and creative and at the same time maybe a bit smaller than it used to be. I would also guess that the kids involved in it today on average are probably more committed and more passionate even though there aren't as many of them. And I think that I think that's, that's augurs well for the future in, in many ways. All of us feel like an outcast at some point in our life. You could be in a room, a whole room full of people and still feel like the only person that exists. And I feel like all of us kind of have that inherent need 
to want to feel like you belong to a certain community. And I don't think you can get that at a lot of places. swinging punches at kids. Fuck you, get the fuck out of here. Come on. Come on, we're all just trying to have a good time. Fucking relax. If you want a fist fight, we'll be waiting for you afterwards. to play the show in Sioux Falls and that I, w I was with Screeching Weasel. I think I was the only one that had come along with them on the tour. And, and Ben Weasel, the leader of the band, was a pretty, he, he fancied himself a pretty tough guy and I guess in some ways he is, but I, I suspect we, he probably wasn't thrilled with going to this uh, piece of place in the first place, but uh, it was very crowded and we sat there in this puppet, uh, I can't really remember, I wish I could remember what it looked like. Uh, sometimes I think it had like a, a train driver's hat or sometimes a chef's hat or something, but whatever it was, it would go around and around, would it bring your order to you? And now you can correct me if I'm remembering this wrong, but it seemed like the guy up in the overhead balcony or something could talk into the microphone and make the puppet talk to you at your table. And as it went, and we'd been sitting quite a while waiting for our pizza, and as it went by, I think he said also, you got somebody got up on the wrong side of bed this morning, ha, ha, ha. And, and Ben just really got annoyed. Uh, said, Shut up, you stupid puppet, and bring us our pizza. And the, the puppet, of course, talked back, uh, ooh, 
I, I'll see what I can do, but you know, cheer up, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. You know, none of, and you, you just, this Ben was the type of person you could not tell to cheer up or lighten up or, I mean, that would just, no matter what the circumstances, uh, he did not see the humor in, in that. The climax basically was, it's, it came around and it still had no pizza for us and well, we having fun here. Uh, I'll, we'll have your pizza soon. Don't worry, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and Ben literally got up. I'll knock your, fuck, your fucking pizza, your stupid puppet head off. I'll, don't you talk. You know, basically got up to fight with the puppet and several of us literally had to restrain him from going and beating up the puppet. Um, and that was, that's pretty much the story because it still had a happy ending. The, um, eventually the pizza came and it was good. Uh, and, and Ben didn't, well, I don't know. I don't think Ben was ever happy about the, the puppet, but, and he probably mentioned it several times more that day, but an insubordinate puppet. Did you really use the whole thing? Sorry, now I've probably messed <laughs> this all up. <laughs> no, I won't use all of it. But now we have to start more. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Okay, I'm done. <laughs>